The Ransom of Mercy Carter, Chapter 7 Kanawake April 20th, 1704, temperature 56 degrees The town was Kanawake, and the river was the St. Lawrence, no soft Massachusetts brook, but a thundering expanse with constant traffic of pirogues, bateau, dugouts, and canoes bound for Montreal, a few miles downstream. There were French voyagers and Dutch traders, Ottawa and Menominee Indians, Sauk and Winnebago, Potatomawi and Fox bringing their furs from the far west. After so terrible a winter came an early spring. In canoes that held ten men, men, the Indians began coming as soon as the ice broke, bringing thousands of beaver pelts. Home they went, loaded with firearms and ammunition, brass and copper, jewelry and dresses for their wives, their paddles slicing vigorously through the water. But that was the river in the city of Montreal. In Kanawake, the week following Captain's arrival was marked by nothing at all. In Deerfield, men would have been out of bed before dawn, coming home for dinner at noon and for supper after dark, lamenting what had not been accomplished. The women would have woven and quilted, mended and cooked and scrubbed. Every child had chores, sewing, stirring, tending animals, minding babies. Then came Bible reading and prayers, and at last, the exhausted collapsed into sleep. But here in Kanawake, nobody did anything. Every now and then, one of the women started another pot of stew, and every now and then, somebody wandered by and ate some. The children played, the men smoked, the women talked, and the babies napped. They are so lazy, said Ruth. It is sinful. Mercy felt dizzy rather than lazy. From the hard labor of Deerfield, she had passed through the ordeal of March and fallen into what? Standing around, staring around, and eating? The girls were at the bake oven, used by all the women of Kanawake, dipping thin crisp corn cakes hot off the pan into thick maple syrup. Mercy could have eaten a hundred. She licked her fingers. Around the girls were barns and shacks and pens for the animals. Between them and the river were more than 50 houses arranged in loose rows, each holding two families or more. There were hundreds of dogs, hundreds of children, dozens of horses, and almost 20 captives. Except for Sally and Benjamin Burt, not one of the captives at Kanawake was an adult. Nobody knew where the parents had been taken or even if any had survived. Behind the houses stretched fields to be planted with corn. Can you imagine these people stirring themselves enough to plant seeds? Snorted Ruth. Closer was another field, avoided by the Indians, who yelled if anybody stepped in it while it was soft and muddy. It was nearly a mile long and a hundred yards wide, and Mercy had not figured out what it was made, what made it special. Every day mass was celebrated, some days by Father Muriel and some days by other priests. Mass washed over her like morning fog over the river, and like a fog, it burned off during the day. It had nothing in common with the services and sermons of Mr. Williams, and to Mercy, it did not feel like religion or meeting. The priest was talking to a Christian god, but since he spoke in his church language Latin, only God could comprehend. Mercy lived with twelve people, not so different from Deerfield, but in one room. Everything was in that room hanging from the ceiling, stored in baskets that slid on their sleeping shelves, stacked in corners, attached to the walls, or just left on the beds until it was time to lie down. Not that anybody cared when you lay down, or when you ate. The family called her daughter, unless they were calling her sister, and so did the neighbors who dropped in. Indians were always dropping in, since nobody was ever busy, it was never a problem. Please stop here and answer question one. It is so disorderly, complained Ruth, and I cannot endure the smoke. They don't even have chimneys, so the smoke just lies around and makes your eyes water. But, oddly, it was warmer without chimneys. At home, the flames went up that brick tunnel, carrying all the heat so that you shivered only a foot from the fire, but in the long house, the heat lay down with you. Of course, so did the smoke. What Mercy could not get over was that husbands and wives lived apart. Even after they were married, the men went on living with their mothers and sisters. Wives lived with their mothers, and the children stayed with them. Mercy, although she belonged to Tana Horns, did not live with him and hardly ever ate with him. She lived with Nistena, his wife, and with Nistena's mother, sister, and brothers, and the sister's children. 
The men in the house, therefore, were the uncles and not the fathers. The children of these uncles lived five houses away with their mothers. All through life, Mercy had dreamed of marriage and having her own home with her own hearth and loom and garden. Girls did not have that here. And when Mercy went to sleep at night on her plank bed, the married couples did not sleep, but did what married couples did. Right there, in front of everybody, while the fire still lit the room. The men went home when they were done. Please stop here and answer question two. Mercy did not discuss this with Ruth. She was not discussing anything with Ruth now. Throughout the march, Mercy had felt clever, possessed of sharp eyes and fine understanding, but in Kanawake, she felt dim and confused. Just when she seemed to be getting along, Ruth would throw her into a tizzy. You know, Mercy, said Ruth, I never expected to live till spring, even in Deerfield. Nobody else had expected it either. I am so surprised to be alive, said Ruth. The march killed many, but it strengthened me. My lungs are better. Now I want to see fifty more springs, but, oh, mercy, I want to see them as an English girl, living in an English colony, speaking English. I can hardly bear to listen to them jabbering in their savage tongue. Night and day, the word ransom pounds in my head. But to the Indians, English was a savage tongue, and Mercy was not surprised when Nistena interrupted them. Mananak, she said firmly. No English. Yes, English, shouted Ruth. Do not give in to her, Mercy. As long as we refuse to be Indian, when ransom comes, the Indians will take their money and shrug. Do not let yourself matter to them, and do not dare betray your real family by letting the Indians matter to you. A few days later, Tom Horns brought Mercy to the stone jetty. Sarah Hoyt sat in a canoe with Indians Mercy had never seen before, while Evan stood on the dock. He had been partly stripped, his chest and face painted in strips of black. His hair was now Indian style, almost plucked out, a little bit left to pull back into a tail. Sarah and I have been sold, said Evan, to masters in a town called Lorette. Tana Horan said we could tell you goodbye. No! Mercy was sick with fear. They couldn't leave her here with just Ruth. Miss Denna hardly ever let her near Joanna or Eustace or Rebecca or Sally Burt. What would she do for strength and friendship? Won't you be here, Evan? Neither will Sarah. How could the Indians move them around so often? When would this end? It would end with ransom, she thought. Until that day, they were booty like the white ruffled shirt. But how would Sarah and Evan be ransomed now? They'd been sold, like horses. The Lorette isn't so far, Mercy, called Sarah, trying to smile. Lorette Indians trade in Montreal just like the Kahnawake Indians do. Tana Horns will take you to Montreal one day. We will look for you. Mercy managed to nod. It was from Montreal that the ransom would come because Montreal was French headquarters. Around Evan's neck, loosely tied, was a beautiful collar embroidered with blue and black mountains. Will you be a slave? she whispered. I don't know. He tried to smile. In Lorette, they are Huron. Six of the dead Indians in Deerfield, including the one I killed, were Huron. So, torture had not been admitted, just postponed. It awaited Evan at this place called Lorette. She wanted to fling herself on top of Sarah and rip away Evan's collar. She wanted to paddle down the St. Lawrence and out into the Atlantic Ocean and down the coast of Maine to the safety of Boston. Don't go, she fumbled. Sarah held her English kerchief to her mouth to hide her emotion, but Evan had steadied himself and stood patiently, waiting to leave. It's worse for them, thought Mercy. They go to yet another unknown. Mercy knew then that she would do whatever Miss Denna asked of her. She did not want to be sold to strangers and dropped into the bottom of a canoe to vanish into a different tribe with different plans. She tried to hug Evan, but he raised his hand quickly to keep her at a distance. He didn't want his new Indians to see some weeping girl clinging to him. The Lord bless you and keep you, Mercy, he said, while we are absent from one another. It was Mr. Williams's benediction, the one she had heard every Sunday of her life. Sarah took her handkerchief from her face, turned away from Mercy, and fixed her eyes on the horizon. She was not about to enter her new unknown as a weakling. So Mercy said nothing more, lest one of them break down. The unknown Indians paddled away. 
She had waved when Daniel disappeared into the mountains, but she could not seem to wave after Evan and Sarah. She stood for a long time, staring at the dwindling dots that were in their canoes until Tana Horns took her back to the house. The act of going inside was the worst part of the day, partly because it was a house, and the only other house she had ever known had also been a home. Homesickness was like a knife. It cut constantly. Homesickness had become work, something to do. Lord, Mercy prayed, don't leave me as Sarah and Evan have. Stay here. Please stop here and answer question three. Then one day the town stirred and moved and suddenly everybody was rushing to and fro, preparing and carrying and gathering. Huge fires were built and haunches of deer were roasted. The bake ovens were full, batch after batch of hot breads laid on wooden woven trays. Maple syrup was beaten into bear fat to make a delicious salty sweet butter. The men painted and prepared for war. Canoes packed with Indian men, women, and children came from other towns. All had dressed in their finest. Beaver and mink and fox were mixed with English coats and Dutch jackets and French scarves. No man or woman was without jewelry, earrings and bracelets, necklaces and anklets. Mercy knew herself to be a Puritan. A plain dress with a white apron and bonnet was the only fashion she had ever known. She could not imagine wearing jewelry, but neither could she take her eyes off of it. French officers arrived, swords hanging at their left side, buttons polished and boots gleaming. The governor of New France, France came and Father Muriel and a dozen other priests. These were greeted by the Kanawake chief, Sadagawade, who was dressed in white, soft white skins, thick white furs, tall white feathers, startling white paint. He looked to Mercy like the ghost of war. He looked magnificent. Savage, muttered Ruth. Please stop here and answer question four. Tana Hortons had painted his face differently than he had the night he stood on Mercy's stairs. She wondered if each pattern had a meaning, and if so, what was the meaning of the face paint he had used today? His cross was shining on his bare chest, and a single lock of black hair had been braided vertically and pierced with feathers so that it rose a full foot above his head. Thorak Wanakin's chest was covered by a necklace of shells and claws so large it could have been the front of a shirt. His scalps trailed behind him like the folds of a robe. So this was how they left for war. Feasting and speeches and farewells from the French. Where would they attack now? Deerfield again? Hatfield? Springfield? Mercy thought of her father. Samuel Carter's face and voice seemed as remote as the beginning of time. She prayed he had not stayed in Deerfield to rebuild. What if, at this very moment, he was working those fertile fields that edged the Deerfield River, far from the stockade, far from safety? She prayed that the destruction of Deerfield had been so complete, so dreadful, that he had gone to his brothers in Connecticut. Attack would hit some English town, and this time, when the Indians came, would the English be ready? Or would they have convinced themselves that the Indians would never come again? The feast was preceded by prayers from Father Muriel, and Mercy had plenty to offer. Dear Lord, in your loving kindness, don't let the Indians attack Deerfield. But since they're going to, Lord, let the settlers be ready. The captives gathered together, and this time nobody stopped them. Ruth was there. Eunice Williams, Rebecca and Joanna and Joseph Kellogg, all in Indian clothing like Mercy herself. Sally and Benjamin Burt and had their baby. Mercy was astonished suddenly to see Mary Harrison, Mary Field, neither of whom she had real, even realized was in Kanawake. How separated we are, she thought. How carefully our Indian families keep us among Indians, rather than among other English. Please stop here and answer question five. Mercy could not cuddle baby Christopher because he was in his cradle board fastened to Sally's back by a burden strap. Mercy kissed his sweet forehead but could not hold his tiny hands. Those tiny hands were what Mercy loved best about babies because his arms had been tucked tightly to his sides. Are they nice to you, Sally? Mercy asked. Your Indian family? Sally hesitated for a long time and 
Then she bowed her head. They are wonderful to me. My own mother could not have been more helpful with my first baby. Even Ruth was silenced by that. It was time for the real prayers, Mohawk prayers from the chief. The white grandmother, who had been a slave for 30 unthinkable years, translated for the Deerfield children. Listen, 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 as the words of the people ascend in the smoke of our offerings. We return thanks to our Mother Earth, to the rivers and streams, to all herbs and plants, to winds both great and small, to the moon and stars, and to the goodness of light. We return thanks to our Creator. It sounds just like a psalm, thought Mercy. I too return thanks to my creator, but the Indians and I, we thank him for different things, and we surely ask for different things. Joseph got restless, jumping from foot to foot until great sky among the warriors frowned at him. After that, Joseph stood utterly still, like a carpet. Mercy couldn't even see him breathe. At last, the spiritual part was over, and the French presented presence was recognized. Sadawadagay, explained their translator, was greatly pleased by the attendance of so many French officers. He said, We thank you for the pleasure you have given us this winter, sending a party to avenge us against the English. What does he mean by that? demanded Ruth. We didn't do anything to him. You breathe, said the white grandmother. Mercy felt sick in her stomach when she was near the white grandmother. She did not want to know the old woman's name, not in English and not in Mohawk. The thirty years, the slavery, the combination of helpless hopefulness and bitterness made Mercy so uneasy. This land belonged to our fathers, cried Sadawadagay. No longer do we let the cattle of our enemy eat grass on the graves of our ancestors. It's true, thought Mercy. My father's cattle did graze on the old Indian burying ground. Please stop here and answer question six. We drink war from our birth, and now our young men have tasted the joy of the fight. We give thanks, so men of France, that you guided us in battle. On this day, we celebrate our return to our families and the beautiful sight of our homes. Mercy looked at the rows of windowless bark huts in any language then, and for any people, home was beautiful. Thanks be to God, whispered Sally Bird. This isn't a war party. It's just a party. They're celebrating what they already did, not what they're going to do. Good, said Joseph. I hope we can eat soon. I'm starving. But first the exchange of presents must occur, and in the fashion of Indians, every gift required a speech. The French gave the Indians muskets and pistols and a speech and more muskets and a speech and chest after chest of bullets and powder. They gave bright blankets and armloads of jewelry, tool after iron tool, pot after brass pot. We'll never eat, Mercy said glumly. Next we have to stand here while the Indians give the French their presents. Ruth looked at her oddly. The Indians have already given the French a present, Mercy, Deerfield. There was venison and fish, beer meat and beaver tail, cider and a strange delicious tea. The French had bought dozens of loaves of real white bread and real berry jam to spread on it. They ate for hours. At last, Mercy found out what the honored field was for, the one that had finally dried out from the mud of spring. It was a ball field. Almost every adult Indian male stripped of his finery and played more or less naked. There were 200 on each team. Everybody had a stick with a cup sewn on, and the game involved throwing the hard balls back and forth from cup to cup, trying to reach the goal and score. Father Muriel called it lacrosse, and he placed bets and cheered the plays. There were a few white men playing, but they had been adopted and were Indians now. Four hundred men played for hours, racing full speed up and down the court that was all but a mile long. Mercy had never seen grown-up men play. She tried to imagine Mr. Williams or Deacon Sheldon celebrating a victory by running around naked and throwing balls. The women and the children and the guests raced up and down the sidelines with their men, cheering or booing. The Stena collected Mercy, having seen how much English was being spoken, and Mercy found herself racing up and down, too, shouting for Tana Horns. 
Please stop here and answer question seven. Spring, or possibly the party, made everybody cheerful and energetic. Miss Den and her mother and sister began sewing tunics from hides tanned last fall and making baskets for gathering corn and berries and nuts and squash later on. It took Miss Denna no more than a few hours to make a gathering basket, and sometimes she whipped the wreaths together so quickly she produced a basket in an hour. Whatever else Mercy might be, she was not a slave. Nobody made Mercy do anything. Either she was considered a child, children in Kanawaki had no chores ever, or too white and too useless to complete a task. There was nothing to do and nobody to do it with, and Miss Denna stopped letting her visit the other captive girls. She saw quite a bit of Joseph, though, because his longhouse was next door. A boy among Indians was special. He was a person who had become a man. Joseph was always being taken somewhere. The Indians loved to wander through the woods and over the streams into the marshes and beyond the hills. Joseph was already part of a group of boys who were wrestling and running and learning to hunt, and Joseph's mother let him use Great Sky's lacrosse stick, which was beautifully carved. Whenever Great Sky took him rambling, Joseph would lord it over Mercy, who never got to do anything. Boredom forced Mercy to ask if she could help Miss Denna. By evening, she had made her first basket, a plain, serviceable thing for field work. Miss Denna showed off Mercy's basket to everyone who stopped by. They complimented her creation as if it were worthy of being sold in Montreal. Daughter, they exclaimed, this is a fine basket. With the excuse that she needed to show off her basket, Mercy managed to slip away and talk to Joseph, and wonderfully, his sister Joanna was with him. The girls hugged and hugged. How Mercy savored speaking English. Does Ruth have a new Indian name? asked Joseph, who never glanced at the basket. They don't call her Fire Eats her anymore. Is she being adopted? Who'd adopt Ruth? Joanna wanted to know. You did a fine job on the basket, Mercy. I'm learning too, but my first one was pitiful. Thank you, said Mercy, and Ruth does have a new name. Spookumenin? Let the sky in. This was the word for the opening in the roof through which the smoke rose. When the fire was low and the weather clear, you could see sky through the hole. The hole could be covered with curls of bark to keep out rain, but the Indians preferred to let the sky in. Please stop here and answer question eight. I'm still calling her fire, said Joanna. She doesn't let any sky into my life. Joanna bounded off to join Eunice Williams. Joanna was 11 and Eunice 7, but they lived in the same longhouse, and whatever happened, they had an English friend to share it with. How Mercy envied them. Mercy's only hope for friendship was Miss Dennis' cousin's daughter, Snow Walker, who was a frequent visitor and pleasant enough. But Indians were less likely to talk for the sake of talk, and Snow Walker hardly talked at all. Snow Walker for a friend would be like a fence post for a friend. The only friend Mercy really had right now was Father Muriel. After Mass, he never failed to greet her. Bonjour, Marie. She loved the soft musical sounds of French. How different they were from English sounds and Mohawk sounds, but in Latin that Father Muriel was teaching her, and the first two words she had learned, Pater Noster, our father. His Bible, from which she studied, was not just printed with words on a page, but had letters in gold with swirls of indigo and scarlet at the start of each chapter. It's the same Bible your father, your English father, read to you, Father Muriel explained, but in Latin. Wherever Catholics were in the entire world, they did not use their own language. They used God's language, and every Catholic everywhere said Pater Noster, even the Kanawake Indians. Most Kanawake could speak at least something in six languages, Mohawk, Abenaki, Huron, French, Latin, and English. Mohawk was shaped differently than English. Names were made up of pieces of words strung together. Her own name eluded her, Mananaf. It's ends and ends, humming in a friendly, summery way, which contained syllables she had not heard anywhere else. Father Muriel, however, called her Marie, and in his presence, so did the Indians. Every Indian had a French Catholic name as well as an Indian name. Miss Dinah's name in Catholic was Marguerite. Her sister was Claire, and Snow Walker was Jeanne. Whether they called her Mananoc, her daughter, or Marie, 
it always seemed to Mercy that they must have somebody else in mind. The word Nistena did not offend her any longer. She used it to address any older woman, and nothing in it seemed to mean mother. Please stop here and answer question nine. It was typical that Ruth was the most difficult captive, but nevertheless the first to be taken into Montreal. Not one English child from Deerfield had ever seen a city, and they were aching to visit. When she got back, Ruth came straight to Mercy's longhouse to tell her everything. Ruth plowed to a stop and stared in horror. They pierced my ears, that's all, said Mercy quickly. Mercy, you are a Puritan. You cannot adorn yourself. Rip those out. Mercy's aunt, grandmother, Snow Walker, and three friends in the Stennis had been discussing earring choices. It was time for a trip to Montreal and Nestena, said Nestena, so Mercy could choose earrings at the French market. Indian women had whole baskets of earrings and Mercy must have at least one pair of her own. Sadly, Mercy put her hands up to remove the earrings. Snow Walker very gently stopped her and positioned herself between Mercy and Ruth. Instead of giving Snow Walker a shove, Ruth said, Montreal is wonderful, Mercy. It's a real city. Wait till you see what Frenchmen wear. Their dresses shine. They have tiny little shoes and their hair is full of ribbons and mercy. They even wear scent. The buildings are stone and the nuns who have Eliza live in a building four or five times as large as our meeting house in Deerfield, maybe ten times larger. The nuns dress like Father Muriel, long black gowns with hoods and white collars and huge crosses and knotted cords at their waists. No English, said Nistena. I'll say anything I want, Ruth told her. Anyway, nothing about Montreal matters. Even your earrings don't matter. I have news, Mercy. News? My brother sought Mercy. She leaped up, hoping, hope racing from heart to feet. Sam, she whispered, John, Benny? Ruth yanked her outside. My brothers, cried Mercy. Miss Stenna and Snow Walker came outside with them. I didn't see your brothers, said Ruth. I didn't see anybody. But we'll all see each other very soon. It turns out that Boston has a very important French prisoner a man named Batiste, who's been sinking English ships for years, but they caught him. They should have hanged him as a pirate, but instead he's in jail. The French want him back. The whole reason they came to Deerfield and got so many prisoners was so that they could force Boston to exchange Batiste for us. My brothers, Ruth, did you learn anything? Sam, John, Benny, did you see any of the fathers and mothers? And Daniel, I never stopped worrying about Daniel. Mananak said Miss Stenna sharply. No English. Spoku men and go home. My name is Ruth, said Ruth, who never cared if they got angry with her. What right do you have to take away my language? She snapped at Miss Stenna. You're just a nasty old squaw. Please stop here and answer question 10. Squaw was more of an English word than a Mohawk word, and it was neither polite nor friendly. Mercy didn't like hearing it used for Nistena. Besides, Indian daughters did not talk back to their mothers or aunts. It was as bad as swearing had been in Deerfield. Mercy looked away from Ruth. Mananak, go indoors, said Nistena. Spookumenin, no English. No, shouted Ruth. You Mohawks took my family, my home and my town. You will never have my tongue as well. Mercy felt as if they were both slapping her face. Ruth's eyes were fierce. She grabbed Mercy with hands that were hot and fevered. Mercy, stop letting things happen. Tana Horns and Estena want you for their daughter. You cannot let that happen. If they adopt you, they will not sell you home. You will be here forever, 30 years even. They will marry you to an Indian boy. Tana Horns and Estena don't have children, Mercy. You would be their hope for sons. Do not cooperate. Remember that Tana Horns is nothing but a murderer. Do not allow them to put earrings in your ears or baskets in your hands. Don't pray with Father Muriel. Don't kneel during Mass. Ransom is coming. Please stop here and answer question 11.